Right, question seven. Now, this one has got a bit of an overlap with what you're going to be taught in um, component three still. So if some of this is a little bit like, well, we haven't done this yet. Yep, we haven't done this yet. But um, Edukas is really nice there. And we're getting these lovely overlap questions. So in a nutshell, for all your different component papers, be ready for everything. You've got a lovely graph between two different bird species. They did not even bother giving you names for those species. They could have, just to give you some as the exciting name and confuse you with them. Lovely graph telling you that the population um, density um, for species B is, yeah, they're at such and such height above sea level and where most of species A live, and that there's a little bit of an overlap zone here. And your first question is, what is your main type of competition at 800 metres? So for you to click in the 800 metres is where species B is only competing with species B within the species. So from that one is the um, intraspecific, sorry, intraspecific. And then afterwards, when you've got the thousand to that sort of where both species interspecies uh, species competition here. So you've got that here. So the intra and the inter for the other one, for where you've got between two different species. Then you've got three density dependent factors. So don't give me anything abiotic here because density dependent is, um, what is it that is happening between the individuals that you have got there? How are they competing with one another? Are they competing for, for food? Is predation, is disease there? So it gives you quite a bit of a range here. Food, water, prey, nesting sites, predators, disease, parasites. So it, it gives you quite a range there, but also some bits that I have to um, reject if it's not qualified, if you've not given a reason for, for, if you say they're competing for the same niche because that's where they're breeding, then I can accept that as, as nesting sites. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Then this one here, that is to do with hemoglobin. Um, so part of that is going to be the transport systems thing of component three. So don't don't freak out about this one. It's like, oh, we haven't learned this yet. Species A has a hemoglobin. Been, sorry, has hemoglobin with a slightly higher oxygen affinity than species B. The chemists amongst you know the word electron affinity already. Think of it, think of it as the stickability of how much it attaches itself to oxygen. Hemoglobin, you know that as a as a polypeptide, sorry, as a ordinary structure from your core concepts. So you have got some familiarity with this. I've been nice with marking, but I still have counted it overall um, because the key ideas need to be there. Explain one advantage and one disadvantage of this to species A. If species A is living where it's living, graph tells you species A seems to be living where it's a higher height above sea level. And again, this is expecting you to click in. The higher we go, the lower the the oxygen availability will be simply because the air is a bit thinner up there. So um, if it's got a higher oxygen affinity, that allows it to cope and live and do well uh, and reproduce and, and do everything else it needs to do at higher altitudes because it can cope with those lower uh, oxygen levels in, in the atmosphere around it. However, the disadvantage if oxygen is binding to hemoglobin really well and sticking to hemoglobin really well, you need to make it unstick or unbind in the tissues of that organism. So as and when the bloodstream hits the capillaries in your muscles, the capillaries in your brain. So it needs to be able to release from that bond as well. So if it, that stickability is increased, that may not be everything an organism wants. OK, Mark scheme gives you the two points for the uh, advantages here. Live at a higher altitude be where there is less oxygen around because Higher oxygen affinity means that it can absorb more oxygen into that hemoglobin. And the disadvantage is that we need to release that uh, oxygen into the tissues again, whichever way around you're expressing that, that will be fine. Cool. Then your three marker here <clears throat> gives you the DNA analysis for hemoglobin, uh, how births evolved into different species. And using all the information given, so your graphs that you've got given and your knowledge, um, explain how natural selection could account for the evolution of those two different species. What was the pathway of natural selection? I remember writing it down for you in little baby steps from you've got 
overproduction of babies. Um, all those babies, not all of them can survive because you've got selection pressure. So some of them will not be able to reproduce, therefore not be able to pass on whatever genes that might code for whatever adaptations that you might have in the in the organism. So how does that apply to this hemoglobin? So if you think of natural selection, those who have got the hemoglobin with higher oxygen affinity, we'll have an adaptation that allows them to live higher up where there's low oxygen. The other ones, we'll not have that adaptation. So gradually, we may have differences in those groups, the ones that have the adaptations and the ones that don't. They're still roughly in the same geographic area. However, they will at some point, due to different allele frequencies, be no longer reproductively uh, compatible. There will be such a shift in those allele frequencies. Um, so think of that mutation. Gave birth that mutation, uh, gave them an advantage. Um, that becomes a selection pressure. The oxygen availability becomes a selection pressure. The ones who have that advantage and that gene for that advantage become from that mutation are more likely to survive and reproduce and then pass on that new allele for oxygen affinity. So. Yeah, I'll leave that with you as food for thought going through that. The last one here. Explain why the evolution of these two species from the same common ancestor is an example of sympatric. Okay, sympatric, allopatric. Allopatric in the same, uh, sorry, uh, being in the same area, allopatric being in two separate geographical areas. They're still in the same geographical area. They're just becoming gradually more reproductively incompatible because one of them has got that mutation and allows it to live at higher altitudes. So living in the same habitat. Had you used that, it's not allopatric, you need to still have a definition of what allopatric would be. So there's no physical or geographical barrier. It's a sort of a smooth transition of going uphill gradually. And it's only that reproductive barrier that you're gradually going to get because of different allele frequencies. That was question seven.